Welcome to Open Source and Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name is Arvan. And I'm Abby. Forgot that part. Very good. <laughs> and we're your hosts. Is it coffee or tea you've got in there? This is water. Yeah. Okay. Boring. I've yeah. got a cup of tea. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software. This is episode nine, and today we chatted with Matt Vaness about his paper, Reducing the Efforts to Create Reproducible Analysis Code with Field Proof. And Matt is a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Oxford. I really enjoyed this focus on reproducible science and just hearing why it's important in neuroscience, and it is important for all of science how he was tackling that through Reproduce Script and how he saw this as a model for other researchers to see best practices for reproducibility. Yeah, I agree. Reproducibility, I agree, is incredibly important. I'll share that one thing that kind of bugs me about reproducibility sometimes is reproducibility for reproducibility's sake. I think there should be a purpose to working reproducibly. There we go. Came out eventually. And so... That reproducibility can be, of course, being able to redo your work again, share more easily, be more transparent when you publish. But I think because he's grown up as a researcher that's had to learn to code to do their work, I got this really strong sense from him that he understood the problems that people really have as a neuroscientist using these tools and has built the tools that he needs to work more effectively, which is really cool. It's a really good way of building useful tools if you solve your own problem first. I also like hearing a bit about Field Trip and just having such a widely used piece of software among neuroscientists. It was cool just to hear more about it. Yeah, for sure. Field Trip sounds like an incredible community, but it also sounds like he's trying to write a Python version. So probably it might have him back on in a few years' time when we are still podcasting. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to have a MATLAB submission. So we talked a little bit about that and proprietary runtimes and open source softwares. But yeah, I thought it was, it was an interesting conversation. Cool. Yeah, let's play it. Let's go. Welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Of course. So Matt, you're a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Oxford, I think. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. I, I did an undergrad in biophysics and then a master's and, and PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And I've been... Uh, postdoc in Oxford for about three and a half years now. Very nice. And how is Oxford today? Is it spring springing or has it gone cold again like it is up here? I, I wish it was uh, spring. No, it's uh, it's quite cold and wet. Uh, exactly what you expect from England. Fair enough. Yes, I agree. Well, there you go. Same here in Toronto. <laughs> Very it's all, slushy. Can, it's raining and cold in Scotland as well. So there we go. Anyway, so yeah, well, thanks for coming on. So tell us about Field Trip and the project. Tell us about what this project does and why you started it. So Field Trip is a uh, MATLAB software toolbox for the analysis of magnetoencephalography data and uh, electroencephalography data. So this is like brain imaging data. And it has been around since about 2011. And it's basically a collection of functions for analyzing your neuroimaging data. Initially, it started as basically just some colleagues at the Donlas Institute in the Netherlands sharing scripts for analyzing data that at the time was quite new and people were kind of figuring out how to analyze these data because they're quite complex and it's, it's, it can be quite difficult to kind of tear a structure out of this data. So that's how it started. And then at some point, they developed a toolbox out of it for other people to use outside of, of the, the local institute. And this has been a great success. Um, I believe the, the main paper has been cited over 4,000 times and it's being used in, in hundreds or, or maybe even thousands of labs in the world. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it really helps a lot of people to, to analyze that data. What we tried to do is actually an addition into this toolbox called Reproduce Script. Because we noticed that a lot of users of Field Trip, they create their own scripts out of specific Field Trip functions. And these scripts, they can become quite complex. Typically, cognitive neuroscientists are not trained in, in programming. So there's a lot of variability and a lot of complexity in a lot of these scripts. And, and we noticed just at the Institute that, that a lot of the code that our colleagues and maybe ourselves were writing was really hard to reproduce. 
And I had played around a little bit with the MATLAB function called diary, which basically saves all the commands that you write into the command window. Mm. And that was basically the beginning of reproduce script. So this is basically an addition that you add to your script when you're using field trip. And it's only a few lines of code, but when you add that, then basically field trip creates a very generic analysis script out of everything that you're doing with the intermediate data. And that means that in the end, after you've done your analysis that might be coming from like quite complex scripts, you also have a script and intermediate data that you can upload or share with colleagues and they can just basically run your entire analysis pipeline with uh, one click on the button. This sounds almost like a sort of a debug log of the analysis run. Is that the right way to think about it? I mean, maybe debug is not quite the right thing, but it's like a verbose sort of version of every step that was taken with the field trip toolbox and sort of capturing state at each point in the analysis. Is that yeah, how to think about it? Yeah, that's correct. I think a lot of people, when they write scripts and functions themselves, everything ends up in different MATLAB scripts. And so there's all these complex dependencies at the end, and we try to get rid of all those dependencies. So you just have like one big script that does everything. So it makes everything very serial. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the big reasons why this paper stuck out to me when I was uh, looking through the recently published stuff was first, that field trip was so popular and widely used. Then second, how you're really focusing on reproducibility and just making it easier for other scientists to reproduce that. So if I understand correctly, the researcher would just write a config file with all the different steps and then reproduce script would create this script in a standard format so that other people can just easily use it. Is that? Yeah, correct? yeah, okay. that's correct. Um, and and uh, this, this configuration um, uh, file that people write, usually you would write one configuration for one specific analysis step. So you mm -hmm. might think of data cleaning as one analysis step. Uh, and uh, maybe spectral analysis is one analysis step. So you, you have different configuration structures for every function. And, and all of these together are then by reproduce script put into one, one big script. It sounds like a really cool project and reproducibility, I think is something that's near and dear to many people's hearts, even for just yourself, you know, making it easier to redo your own work can often be a real challenge, right? You go back to look at something you did a year ago and you're like, yep, I don't know how that worked. So this is good. I was curious to learn a bit more about this. I think you said, did you say diary function in MATLAB? So it's like some kind of his, history thing. Is that, is that, I've, I've never heard of that. I'm curious to learn a bit more about, I guess, how much you're just reusing what the language supports already and how much work you had to do with the reproduce script functionality. How much are you just leveraging this kind of capability that the language has versus like writing lots of code yourself? Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, I think most of it is actually code that we've written. It's only, I think that the, the, the MATLAB inherent diary function was the inspiration for this because mm. the MATLAB diary only captures everything you put in the command window, but reproduce script captures everything that is happening in, in functions, even if they don't have any outputs to the command window. So field trip makes use of a set of functions called the preamble and the postamble. And these are used at the beginning of each script and at the end of each script, or, or sorry, field trip function. And this is basically keeping track of all the data bookkeeping versions and making sure everything runs smoothly. And this is then also where the reproduce script functionality happens. Well, yeah, thanks for that. I haven't touched MATLAB in 20 years, I realized. I was just thinking back, like, oh, I didn't even know about this diary function. But I'd love to hear a bit more about reproducibility and why this matters so much for neuroscience. Open science is great and sharing scripts is great. But if it's only that, then, then sometimes there, there's still a lot missing, right? For example, the case I'm not trained at writing code, which is still the, the case for me. And, and as you said before, I'm also like angry with my previous self for not documenting my scripts better. Right. And in the past, maybe five years or so, there has, it has become obvious that in, in large parts of psychology, but also large parts of neuroimaging, and neuroscience, there is a lack of reproducibility. Um, of course, we all know that um, 
the incentives for publishing exciting results are not always in line with doing solid science. And yeah, so we wanted to improve this reproducibility and make it easier for people to make their analysis reproducible. More and more funders now are requiring you to upload code and data when you publish a paper, but often either people upload their code and it might not work, or they're very nervous about sharing that code because it, it looks a bit ugly, or they will only send it to someone when they request it. And then still it might be really hard to actually get that code to work. So that's why we envisioned a functionality that was really easy to use. And if people are already using FieldTrip, it doesn't require any more training besides maybe doing a five minute tutorial. Yeah, I think the reproducibility, I mean, it's, I think it's called a crisis in many areas. And I think people will probably be aware of that. I think it's a really important problem for all areas of research to be aware of. And I think some areas probably have to work harder than others on addressing that. I think good software practice is one of the tactics that we should strongly favor. Good software and open source software is a good way of thinking about how to at least solve some of that problem. What's it like working on open source software in a proprietary language like MATLAB? Does that cause you any problems day to day? I was curious. Also, I think there's a language called Octave as well, which is like an open source version. I was curious if this runs on Octave or whether a user has to have a MATLAB license to use field trip and also to use, therefore, I guess, re re reproduce script. Yeah, as far as I know, you can use field trip with Octave, but personally, I've never done so because I've always had MATLAB license. Yeah. The reason why we use MATLAB is mostly historic. I think Python wasn't really a, a, as big as it is now, like 10, 15 years ago. And there are some benefits with a licensed software like MATLAB, as in it gives you a, a large set of base functions that are already there. It's relatively robust, but it is a bit tricky if you don't have a license. That is true. Every year there's a, a, a field trip toolkit organized at the Donos Institute. So people are also actively trained in using the software and using the analyses. And, and every year there are a few people that say that at their home university, they don't have a MATLAB license, what to do now? Mm. So, so yeah, and in that respect, it, it, it can be a bit annoying and it would be great if we can kind of go away from, from that model. Cool. Okay. Thanks. I didn't even know about Octave. So this is enlightening. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. We, we get this uh, side note on Joss. We decided very early as the journal that we would accept submissions where the runtime was proprietary because we said the software is still open source, the runtime might not be, and that's okay. But I think we say something like we would prefer people use open source languages, but it's not a requirement. That's interesting. Yeah, back to Reproduce Script. Have you used this to look at any research problems at all or know of any other groups that have used it? Actually, no, so far not. Um, brand new. In, yeah, brand new. As in, it's been out for a while, but we haven't really advertised it as much. I wrote this basically at the end of my time at the Donalds Institute and that when I moved on, I actually made a switch to Python, which is a bit of a pity because I think there is real use in Reproduce Script. The audience in, that we have in mind is mostly the field trip user that is not very proficient in, in writing code and in mm -hmm. what I would say maybe code hygiene. I'd like to see my, myself as someone who is like slightly above that. So I haven't been doing any new projects using field trip in a while. And that's part of the reason why I haven't used it myself. But I think for especially a beginner in field trip, it can be very helpful. And also outside of the field trip end user, we kind of wanted to publish this work to showcase a strategy that you could use in any research field. But this is all specific to the field trip tool toolbox. Uh, but hopefully it will uh, get people to think a bit more about how can we improve the reproducibility of our own analysis and our own software. Hopefully this podcast can maybe get the word out and get a few more users of uh, Reproduce Script. Absolutely. That, that'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you were sort of hinting at this, Matt, in your last answer, but like, how do you think about config-driven work? You said something about this is something that can help 
people who are maybe less technically competent or experienced, you know, the sort of things that we do as software engineers that just come naturally to us, you know, maybe like use version control or think about how to structure our work. But there's lots of people who just are trying to do science, right? They're just trying to get their work done. And so do you feel like config driven science? I don't know if you like that phrase, but let's go with it for now. Like config driven research is a really important tactic for people to do their work. Is that like an opinion that you hold and that you want to push more on? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, a, a conflict is, is quite simple. Um, it's, it's a simple concept, but very broadly useful. It helps, especially, w for example, the config is really easy when you're still making functions or writing functions and then they change and you can hide all that complexity in the one function that deals with the config. Right, so there's only one kind of layer of complexity there. I think that's really useful. And it can also be a very kind of concise way of capturing everything that you want to do. So it's, yeah, usually I guess a config is also easier to share with colleagues and peers than just a list of verbally saying what you did. Yeah, for sure. Right, that makes sense. And are there any other strategies that you're adopting to improve transparency and reproducibility of your science? Yeah. So now here in Oxford, I'm working on a software toolbox that is very similar to Filtrap, but it's in Python. It's building on top of a toolbox called m &E Python, which is widely used. But for our purposes, so I'm part of a methods lab uh, and we always like to do things our own way. And if m &E Python doesn't have them, then we decide we have to uh, write them ourselves. And so that's why we're writing a, a, a software package called the uh, OBA software library or OSL. We also have a config structure that we try to keep as concise as possible. So it's basically maybe 25 lines of code that captures an entire uh, pipeline. And I think that gives you a good overview of what you've done. So you can really you don't even have to scroll through it. You can just show the config and it will clearly show you every step you've done. That also helps in sharing. Another thing is not really software related, but it's more looking at analyses and, and the way we do science. Because more and more in neuroscience and neuroimaging, we're making use of uh, data-driven techniques coming from uh, machine learning. And in, in my own research, I try to find structure in these complex data. So for example, I'm trying to find temporal structure in when specialized brain networks activate. But if you're using a data-driven technique, then a critic could, can al always say, well, you've just fitted a model to your data and it will always give you an output. We know that what you're showing us is actually something real and something physiological. So in a paper that I'm trying to publish now, I've apply the same methods to five independent data sets and show that all the results replicate over all of those data sets. And that's another way to kind of think about how can I really show that the science that I do and the results that I show reproduce and are robust. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, if you can share the links, especially to the software, the Python software you're mentioning earlier, I will be sure to include that in the show notes. People can check it out. If you're... Oh, brilliant. Any neuroscientists jumping to Python? Yeah, very good. So I have a sort of bit of a question about just you and your experience. Like, how did you get into open source software? Could you say a little bit about what the sort of origin story of you contributing open source? Yeah, so I did my PhD, my master's and my PhD at the Donless Institute, where Shieldtrip Toolbox was initially uh, written. And uh, the people who trained me during my PhD, including my PhD supervisor, are the main developers of the field trip toolbox. So it was kind of very naturally ingrained in me that this was important. And uh, yeah, so this project was also part of my PhD, where I was uh, also kind of expected to contribute to the development of the field trip toolbox. But it also, in a way, came a bit more natural by sometimes asking people, oh, can I, can I have your code to try this on my data and then it's very frustrating to actually make that code work if it doesn't immediately. Often there's just so many dependencies uh, both on different toolboxes that you might have locally installed and on complex scripts and directory structures that 
it it just so hard sometimes to yeah use somebody else's code so that really kind of empirically gave me the observation well it's, it's really important that we make sure that that we can do this easily and i think i'm quite a good person to try and kind of develop these methods because i myself am not formally trained to do any programming and i work with people that have less experience in programming and with people that are formally trained in programming and it's kind of good to sit there in between and, and understand the challenges of everybody who doesn't have a doctorate in, in computer science. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. I think you can see the challenges that your peers would face because you've come up not through a sort of a software engineering track. That makes sense. I had a sort of little bit of a follow up on that as well. And this is probably a very hard question to answer, but. Relative to other research areas, what's the state of open source software in neuroscience? Is it well-developed? Is it still sort of weird and new? It sounds like your supervisors for your PhD were like, you will do this because we're doing it. So that was easy. But are they unusual? Like what's the sort of state of open source software in, in your discipline? It's, it's getting better, but there's definitely room for improvement. So okay. I think the closer you are to people actively developing open source software, uh, the more likely you are to share your own code and your own data. But generally speaking, there's still a lot of papers that say, if you want my code or my data, you have to email this email address, which sometimes code is not available being on request. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's definitely moving in, in a good direction. There's nowadays also more people that are switching to Python, which I think also helps in, in making everything more transparent. So yeah, we have a long way to go, but we're on the right track, I think. That's, that's great to hear. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, just to switch gears a little bit, why did you decide to publish in JAS? So I guess part of it was curiosity. It's a very different model of publishing your work compared to a traditional paper, where here the GitHub repository is the first priority, really. So that's one. And then also it, it seemed like quite a natural fit because as I started t talking about reproduce scripts, open science and reproducibility are, are very closely interlinked. So we thought that, that JOS would be a really good platform to talk about reproducibility. Did it go okay? I actually don't remember the review. I know the paper took a while to go through a review. So sorry about that. <laughs> Thankfully that was okay. Did the review go okay from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, there, there were some challenges. So one of the challenges was that when I started working on Reproduce Scripts, I was new to Git and GitHub, which meant that my local Git was a big mess. And in the end, rather than pushing all my commits to the field trip toolbox myself, I still basically copied and pasted code and gave it to my supervisors and then they put it in the field trip toolbox. And in the end, um, when, when we tried to publish this in, in, in JAWS, um, initially there was a question of whether I, I had done anything at all because right. I was completely absent from the GitHub repo. So yeah, that was a bit frustrating, but it all yeah. worked out in the end. Very good. Yeah, I can imagine somebody will have spotted that. So we do look at the commit history to see if you're publishing something that you should reasonably be able to publish. Yeah. So how can people contribute to Reproduce Script? What kind of skills do they need? help you out even if they don't have any programming skills but they have ideas of how to improve it or they may be using field trip and they have tried reproduce script opening a issue in, in github or sending an email to the field trip mailing list is always a good idea to share your thoughts or to send a piece of code that you think might improve it so either github or through the field trip mailing list nice Are you good? And I know you mentioned some of the other projects you're working on, but is there any yeah. other open source software you're currently working on? Yeah, yes. So at the lab in OBA in Oxford, we're also building software for analyzing electrophysiology data. One is similar to FieldTrip, but based in Python. It's called OSL, and this can be found on GitHub on the OBA, that's O-H-B-A analysis page. And then there's one called OSL Dynamics, which is about generative modeling of brain data, which can also be found at the same GitHub page. Just to close us off, how can others find you online? And oh, will you be presenting this work anywhere, perhaps? 
Yes, yes, I will. Uh, so online, I, I guess Twitter is the easiest. That's Matt's, M-A-T-S underscore Van underscore E-S. And I will presenting this work specifically at the Biomac conference in Sydney, Australia at the end of August. And I will also go to a conference of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society in Toronto next month in April. Hey, say hi when you're here. I'll do. That'll be fun. Cool. Hey. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to tell us about your software. This sounds like a really cool project. I love its origin story. It sounds like you're doing a bunch of really interesting and exciting work. Thanks for sharing your time with us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arthur Smith and me, Abby kubunak Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Boxcat Games. Thank you.